Welcome back to the series where I kill every Elder Dragon in Monster Hunter. This video is the third installment of the series. In this video, I will focus on the third generation Elder Dragons, comprising of Elders from Monster Hunter Tri, Monster Hunter Portable 3rd, and Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate. There are a total of seven Elder Dragons introduced in this generation, with no Elder Dragon appearing from the previous games in the Monster Hunter series, marking a change in the series. I also wanted to mention, whilst I try to be comprehensive when fighting each elder, my review of each monster may miss a few things, but I aim to be as accurate as possible. Once again, I wanted to say that I'm grateful for the support on the previous two videos. I'm almost now at 1000 subscribers, which is insane. Three of the elder dragons from this video use underwater combat, which is a style of combat exclusive to third gen monster hunter. In my opinion, underwater is a mixed bag, with the gameplay changing drastically depending on what weapon the player uses. I mostly use Greatsword, as I'm a Greatsword main, though I do play Longsword and Insect Glaive occasionally, so my opinions on underwater fights are based upon the experience of a Greatsword user. So once again, without further ado, here is how I beat every Elder Dragon in Monster Hunter. Generation 3 is an interesting generation in the Monster Hunter series. In my eyes, it marks a transition in the series. This is the generation that divides the more modern Monster Hunter games from the older style Monster Hunter games. This is for a myriad of reasons I won't really get into in this video. There are three games in 3rd gen. Monster Hunter Tri, Monster Hunter Portable 3rd, and Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate. Overall, 3rd gen really stands alone in the Monster Hunter series with all its unique gimmicks and quirks. Tri has three new Elder Dragons, Seadus, Gen Moran, and Elatrian. Two of these Elders are final bosses of the offline and online modes in the game, ensuring that you don't encounter them until the latest stages of the game. Each one of the three Elder Dragons in Tri feels really powerful, as they introduced a new Black Dragon and two of the largest monsters in the series for Tri's catalog of Elder Dragons. Seadus is a gigantic elder dragon, most similar in body shape to a whale. It stands at a whopping 5,837.2 centimeters, and it is the final village boss in Monster Hunter Tri that can only be fought in single player. Seadus is fought entirely underwater in a unique location called the Underwater Ruin. The description in game for Seadus reads Legendary elder dragon known as both Shining Giant of the Depths and great sea dragons, not confirmed to exist until recently. The Mocha quakes were due to a Cetus butting its abnormally long horns into the earth. Cetus mostly ignores the player for the first two areas of the fight, however in the final underwater ruin section, Cetus ramps up the intensity of the fight, shooting massive water beams at the player. Cetus has a giant beard, two horns and a tail. Its horns are massive and will eventually grow so large that they leave it blind. Seedus is completely unaffected by all statuses, including poison, paralysis, sleep, and KO. So make sure to use element on Seedus as it is weakest to the dragon element. The first time I fought Seedus, I was really taken aback by the grandeur of the fight. It seemed really majestic, as it was such a large monster. I really enjoyed the atmosphere the fight created, especially as you pursue it in the first phase of the fight. The first time you fight Seadus, a cutscene will play, showing it swimming into the underwater ruins. Within the ruins, the fight takes place over three different areas. The first section of the underwater ruins is a long snaking underwater cavern, where Seadus will swim alongside the hunter 
as the Cedus theme plays in the background. There isn't much to the first cavern, save for some rubble that Cedus destroys with a water beam, so make sure to get out of its path when he does it. The second area is much the same, as the fight continues on, in this regard it is quite similar to the Laoshan Long fight, in that it is long and the monster doesn't really interact with you until the last phase of the fight, so it's not a very engaging first phase of the fight. This is until the last section of the fight. Another thing of note is that Cedus's beard must be broken before the end of the second phase, otherwise Cedus will swim away and the player will fail the quest, so the beard should be focused on in the first two areas of the fight. When the beard is broken, Cedus will begin to swim quickly through the first two areas, beelining towards the final area of the underwater ruins. In the final area of the fight, a cutscene will play, greeting you to Cedus curled up in a ball, getting ready for the final part of the fight. He then does a giant water beam, showing he's ready to take the hunter head on. During this part of the fight, the main goal of the hunter should be to first break Cedus' horns and then finish him off. The Dragonator can be used underwater during the fight and provides a great opportunity to break off the horns of Cedus. Additionally, Ballistae located underwater can be used to shoot at Cedus, dealing damage. The Ballistae require underwater Ballistae ammo a type of Ballistae ammo unique to 3rd gen. This phase of the fight is by far the best section of the fight, as Cetus will swim around the large cavern, trying to physically slam the hunter and use its water beam. If the hunter carts or far casts back to camp during this final showdown, there are some shortcuts in the camp that allow you to get directly back to this area and resume the fight, instead of swimming through areas 1 and area 2 again. Cetus can be repelled or killed, and if the player repels Cetus, by timing out, Cedus retains its health from the previous encounter and the fight immediately skips to area 3. Cedus' beard, its hood, each horn and its tail can be broken, and in the case of the horns, one of the horns breaks completely off, allowing players to carve them twice, making it worth it to focus on the horns. The fight really doesn't change much depending on the weapon the hunter uses. In Monster Hunter Try, Cedus can only be fought in Village as the final boss in single player. It is not accessible through the online hub, Locklack City. Finally, to one of the best siege fights in the series, Gen Moran. Gen Moran shares the same skeleton as Cedus, and is a massive monster, standing 11,161.9 cm, which is just under twice the size of Cedus. Gen Moran is fought on a sand ship, which has several different battlements lining it, including ballistae, cannons, a hunting gong, and a dragonator. During the fight, the player can climb onto Gen's back at certain times, this is in order to break the spines located on its back and mine ore, as well as gem parts. The description for Gem Moran is as follows. Rare ore can be mined from these enormous dragons' backs, thus they are considered prosperity symbols. They swallow vast amounts of organic matter, and are always surrounded by scavenging delics, which sailors use to locate them. It is said that Gen Moran and Cedars share the same common ancestor. Gen has several breakable parts on its body, including both tusks, the spines on its back, and its arms. It inhabits the Great Desert, which is a giant desert comprising of two main areas, which are both used in the fight. Overall, I quite enjoy the Gen Moran fight. It introduced a unique siege fight mechanic that was used with two other monsters, Hello Gen Moran, a subspecies, and Daran Moran, which was introduced in Gen 4. In Monster Hunter Try, Gen is an online exclusive monster, as it can only be fought in Locklack. Gen Moran's fight is unique and engaging, and I personally consider it one of my favourite fights in the series. At the start of the fight, a cutscene will play, which shows Gen Moran slowly swimming up to the side of the ship and then jumping over. It really showcases the size of Gen, alongside with its immense power. 
When the fight begins, the players will spawn on the inside of the ship, where the item box contains ballista ammo, a one-shot binder, anti-dragon bombs, alongside all other things like potions and rations. The one-shot binder can be used to prevent Jen from dealing damage to the ship and reducing its integrity. Both the binder and hunting gong should be used in the hunt, as it reduces the amount of damage the ship will take. The first phase of the fight takes place on the sand ship, where the hunter will sail alongside Jen, attacking it from afar using the ballistae and cannons on the ship. The best strategy for the first phase is to shoot ballistae at Jen, particularly towards its tusks or arms, as the tusks are breakable from the first phase. From here, there should be several opportunities to jump on its back in order to break the different spines lining its back. You can stay on Jen's back for a certain period of time, as if you're on Jen's back for too long, the camera will start to shake, and Jen will throw the hunter off of its back onto the sand, dealing a lot of damage and causing the hunter to need to climb back onto the ship. After a certain amount of time on the right side of the ship, Jen will change sides to go on the left side of the ship, and will most of the time try to ram the ship. If Jen does ram the ship, either use the one shot binder or hunting gong to prevent the ship taking damage. From here, you should be able to climb onto Jen's back, this time from its tusks and deal damage to Jen. After Jen has travelled to the left and right side of the ship, it will go to the front of the ship, where you can use the Dragonator, as Jen will once again try to ram the ship. These are all the main aspects of Phase 1. When Phase 1 ends, text will pop up on the screen saying, now entering the final showdown. The second part of the fight allows you to run up to Jen and attack its body and physically take on Jen, as well as pick it off from a distance with cannons and ballistae. Phase 2 is the final phase of the fight. The goal is to repel or kill Jen and retain the integrity of the ship. Phase 2 allows the hunter to break Jen's arms and also break the tusks if they weren't broken in the first phase. Make sure to use the Dragonator when Jen gets too close and the hunting gong and binder when it is about to slam the ship. This is because Jem will try to do either a massive swipe or slam the ship frequently during the second phase, particularly when it is close to the ship, reducing the integrity of the ship. At the start of phase two, Jem will appear on the opposite side of the area to where the players spawn, so Jen will take a little while to arrive at a point where you can comfortably attack it. Apart from that, phase two is pretty straightforward. Make sure to deal enough damage to kill Jen, and make sure the ship doesn't get destroyed. Jen Moran has a plethora of attacks. Here are a few of them. In the first phase, Jen can ram the ship, throw stones towards the ship hitting hunters and slam the ship from the left, right and the front. In the second phase, Jen can roar, slam the ship, do a giant sweep throwing hunters off their feet into the air, a belly flop, and can also shoot stones towards the hunters. When Jen dies, it will flop and roll onto its side. However, it can die outside the arena if it is pushed back out of Area 2 of the Great Desert. So be careful when killing Jen. Jen Moran has eight calves, four on the head and four on the body. There are a couple additional calves as you can also carve inside its mouth if it flops over during the fight, which will happen when you time the hunting gun well. A feature of the fight you need to try is that during the dragon ship phase, if players are climbing back onto the ship, they can be hit by the rocks that Jen Moran throws. Jen's fight encourages a lot of teamwork, as it is a siege fight that was designed with multiplayer in mind, and is the urgent to unlock high rank in try. Overall, I really enjoyed fighting Jen Moran. It stands as my favourite fight in months on to try. The fourth Black Dragon, or dangerous first class monster introduced into the Monster Hunter series, Alatrian. Alatrian is a large dragon that is lined with scales that face backwards. It has a chest plate, a mouth that is shaped like a beak, and stands at 3105 centimeters. Alatrian is the final boss of Monster Hunter Tri's online multiplayer, 
located in Lochlack City. A latrine is unlocked at Hunter Inc. 50, and once defeated, unlocks the six star quests of the online hub. A latrine is an elementally unstable monster, having control over four elements. Dragon, Fire, Ice, and Thunder in the third gen and fourth gen, however it was also given control over water in fifth gen. Its description reads, Blazing Black Dragons, so named for resembling both lightning and darkness. They mercilessly tear apart whoever touches their sharp scales. Elementally unstable, their actions can affect the very weather, living natural disasters. Alatrian are very reclusive, and are usually only found in extreme environments, where they are isolated from most life. Despite being so solitary, they are very territorial, and will attack anything when provoked. Alatrian is found in the Sacred Land in 3rd Gen which is a special area that resides within the third gen volcano. The sacred land is an area covered in lava and has two holes in the middle dividing the area. The sacred land acts as an arena where the hunters fight Alatrian. Alatrian is susceptible to paralysis and sleep, but like all other elder dragons, can't be trapped. Both of Alatrian's horns can be broken, its wings damaged, tail severed and front claws broken. Cutting its tail provides two extra calves and can be severed at any point during the fight. One of the most difficult drops to obtain is a Sky Piercer, as it requires both horns to be broken and only has a 15% chance of being dropped after in the rewards menu. Alatrian's meaning in the Wyvarian language of the Monster Hunter world means Dawn's Triumph. The fight. Alatrian's fight in Monster Hunter Tri is quite difficult as Alatrian deals a lot of damage. In 3rd gen, Alatrian has two modes, Ground Mode and Flight Mode. When in these modes, Alatrian's attacks change depending on what mode it is in. In Ground Mode, it favours Dragon Element and Fire Element attacks, however in Flight Mode, Alatrian prefers to use Ice Element and Thunder Element attacks. Alatrian's weaknesses shift depending on whether it is in Ground Mode or Flight Mode. In ground mode, Alatrian is weakest to the ice element, then water element, but in flight mode, Alatrian is weakest to dragon element, then the fire element. At the start of the quest, a cutscene will play where Alatrian appears and does a couple moves. Once the cutscene ends, the players are thrown straight into the hunt, as the only ways to get back to the camp are to either cart or farcaster. From here, the hunt isn't very complex. Just manage a Latrine's attacks and don't cart. A popular way to hunt a Latrine and try is sleep bombing. The strategy involves a group of players bringing one or multiple sleep weapons into the hunt, as well as bombs, and the materials to craft bombs. In the hunt, the players will induce sleep on a Latrine and then place bombs on a Latrine's head, then rinse and repeat until they run out of bombs. Sleep bombing is ideal when trying to break the horns on a Latrian's head and break the wings. After you run out of bombs, the hunt continues on as normal, and once again the player should just try to deal enough damage to kill a Latrian. Hammer is a good weapon to use against a Latrian, as it is quite susceptible to being stunned. That being said, there aren't really any weapons that are unusable against a Latrian. They are all viable against a Latrian. A Latrian has a whole host of moves, but the main ones, including shooting balls of flame that create a fireball, spraying ice out of its mouth, and charges towards the hunter that are imbued with the dragon element. Some other things to note are that a Latrine can be flash bombed out of the sky when it's in flight mode, and its roars require high grade earplugs. There were no returning elders from the previous games, as Monster Hunter Tri was turning over a new leaf for the series. There were only three large monsters that returned from previous generations in Tri, that being Rathlos, Rathian, and Diablos. As there are no returning elders, there isn't a whole lot else to say about Monster Hunter Tri.
Monster Hunter Portable 3rd is a game uniquely placed in the Monster Hunter series, as it was the first game to really focus on having a polished feel, with the graphics and sound design being a focus during game development. This really comes across when you compare it to the previous portable games in the series, Monster Hunter Freedom Unite and Monster Hunter Freedom 2, which whilst having a lot of content, don't exactly look pretty. Monster Hunter Portable 3rd omitted underwater combat, which was an interesting choice, as underwater combat returned in Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate. There are three Elder Dragons in this game, Amatsu, Gen Moran, and Alatrian. Amatsu is the final boss of the online hub of Monster Hunter Portable 3rd. It has a leviathan-like body and is 3133.8 cm. Its description reads, Deep within the misty peaks, an elder dragon descends onto the mountain summit. It appears as the personification of a large storm, and its appearance has become a Yukomo village tradition. Amatsu is a highly territorial monster, attacking airships and other monsters by using its destructive storms and power over the elements. Amatsu has two horns that adorn its head, and its body is covered in fins that line its back. Amatsu's head can be broken twice, its front fins are broken, its back and the tail can be cut. It can only be killed and can't be repelled, so if you time out, you fail the quest. Like Kushala Deora, Amatsu has control over wind, however its control is much stronger and Amatsu's control over wind can't be dampened during the fight. Amatsu uses the water element, and is weakest to the dragon and fire elements. The Amatsu fight in 3rd generation is very distinctive, as Amatsu does not reappear in Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate, meaning this is the only 3rd gen game where Amatsu is fightable. Amatsu has an ecology cutscene, where it is shown taking down an airship, as it shoots a water beam that obliterates the airship, causing the airship to come crashing down to the ground. In-game, once Amatsu is killed, a special cutscene will play, showing storm clouds on the sacred pinnacle clearing, as Amatsu's control over the weather withers away. Amatsu is fought on the sacred pinnacle, an area exclusive to Amatsu's fight, which is somewhere in the vicinity of the mountains around Yukimo village. The main area of the Sacred Pinnacle has four ballistae, which can be used to bind Amatsu with ballistae binders, or shoot at him with ballistae ammo. In the first phase, Amatsu has its base moveset, incorporating sweeps, water beams, charges towards the hunter, and a big wind-up attack, where it creates a tornado pulling everything into the center for a period of time before releasing the attack that deals a lot of damage if you're hit. Amatsu proceeds to get angrier as the fight goes on, culminating at the start of Phase 2, as Amatsu will start incorporating lightning into its attacks. During Phase 2, the wind intensity picks up, its attacks get stronger and quicker, and the music changes. Phase 2 really shows Amatsu coming to its most powerful state, as the music picks up and the rain keeps lashing down on the players. Phase 2 is also a great time to use the Elastic Binders, as they provide a great opportunity to attack Amatsu so make sure not to not let them go to waste. Another thing I find interesting about the Amatsu fight is that its similarity to Shantian, a monster found in the Monster Hunter Frontier series. Shantian was basically Frontier's version of Amatsu. That was until Amatsu was added to Frontier. Shantian shares a lot of moves with Amatsu, as well as having a similar design. Overall, Amatsu is a really great fight, with a striking visual design that really makes it stand as a staple of Monster Hunter Portable 3rd. In Monster Hunter Portable 3rd, Seedus was removed from the game due to the absence of underwater combat. However, Gem Moran and Alatrian were in the game, both receiving their own fights, as well as a couple modifications.
Jen Moran is fought several times in Portable 3rd, and appears as the Urgent at the end of Village. There aren't a whole lot of changes in the Portable 3rd version of the Jen Moran fight, however, the changes made are of some note. The main change I noticed was that the integrity of the ship was changed to percentages, rather than being represented by Normal, Low, and Warning. This makes it much easier to track how damaged the ship is. I wish they kept this change going to 3 Ultimate. Jen Moran's fight is pretty much the same as it was in Try. Go through Phase 1 the same, jump on its back and use the binders and hunting gong when necessary. Phase 2 is also similar, just make sure the ship isn't destroyed and you don't triple cut. Alatrian feels significantly easier in Monster Hunter Portable 3rd, in my opinion. The mechanics of the fight work the exact same, and the only real changes are how it is unlocked. With it no longer being the final online boss, rather it is unlocked by clearing all double monster quests in high rank. Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate serves as the G-Rank expansion to Monster Hunter Tri, and optimized a lot of the game's features from the previous two games, such as there now being a high rank village, all 12 weapons are in the game, and they're all usable underwater. New monsters were also added, including two new Elder Dragons, Hallowed Gen Moran and Goldbird Seedus. However, both of them are subspecies. Hello Gen isn't too different to regular Gen Moran. It has some different attacks, but it tends to attack the ship more frequently than base Gen Moran. It is unlocked by killing almost every monster in the game, including Electrian and the Metal Rats. It stands at a giant 11,161.9 centimeters. Once again, Hello Gen Moran inhabits the Great Desert and is mostly fought in the same way. Its description reads, a subspecies of Gen Moran, whose appearance has been likened to a crystal shimmering in the darkness. It inspires such awe and wonder that news of a sighting draws a stampede of hunters from across the land. Hello Gen is weakest to the fire element, and apart from that, all the strategies for the hunt don't change from regular Gen. I really liked Hello Gen Moran's design, it looks really nice with crystals lining its back. Hello Gen Moran mostly shares the same fight from regular Gen Moran. Hello Gen can only be fought in G rank, so it has a G rank exclusive move. A giant sand beam that it can shoot that can injure both hunters and the ship. Hello Gen Moran also tends to change its attack pattern when compared with Gen Moran. At the start of the fight, Hello Gen will try to ram the ship, catching hunters by surprise. It will then continue to ram the ship frequently during phase 1 meaning the hunters need to be careful with how they use the hunting gong and ballista binder. Phase 2 is virtually the same between Hello Gen Moran and regular Gen. However, I found that Hello Gen tends to shoot more stones towards the ship and tends to be more aggressive towards the hunters. Once again, there aren't many variations between Hello Gen and regular Gen. However, the drops from Hello Gen do reflect his color palette swap, which is cool.
a subspecies of Cetus, introduced in Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate. Goldbeard Cetus appears similar to regular Cetus, but it's covered in a golden hide, giving it a noticeable colour change. Goldbeard Cetus is 5837.2 cm, making it the same size as regular Cetus. Much like regular Cetus, Goldbeard uses water element in its attacks. The description for Goldbeard Cetus is a rarely seen subspecies of Cetus confirmed to exist deep within the ocean ruins. The golden light they cast in the dark depths defits a creature of such legendary status. Sadly, little is known about their relationship to the standard Cetus. Goldbeard Cetus is fought in the underwater ruin and cannot be repelled, only killed. To add on to the differences, there are a few visual differences from the regular Cetus, such as Goldbeard having both eyes completely covered by its horns, and obviously Goldbeard being covered in gold. Goldbeard Cetus' fight is quite different from the regular Cetus's, as at the beginning of the fight, a cutscene will play mirroring Cetus's cutscene. It begins with Goldbeard being curled up into a ball, unfurling, and shooting a water beam. For the Goldbeard fight, the players don't need to travel through areas 1 and 2. The fight begins in the final area of the underwater ruin, which is an improvement from the Cetus fight in my opinion. Goldbeard is also fought in Port Tanzia, the online hub for Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate, right at the end of high rank, as it is the G rank urgent. Goldbeard has a different move set to the standard Cetus, as it utilizes beams a lot more than base Cetus. These include a giant beam that it fires sweeping, going from left to right across the area, and swimming to the top of the underwater ruins, which takes quite some time. It then fires a vertical water beam that may hit players if they aren't paying attention. Both of Goldbeard Cetus's horns can be broken off and carved from, unlike Cetus, which only has one horn that gives extra carves. The Dragonator can be used several times during the fight and is quite easy to use, as Cetus has a choreographed path towards the Dragonator. Cetus will swim down to the bottom of the ruins before ascending towards the Dragonator, which is when, when the player should activate it, hopefully hitting it in the head or horns for a lot of damage. One of the elusive black dragons, the fifth of its kind, Diamoralis stands at 6288 centimeters and is the final boss of online Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate, capping the end of the third generation of Monster Hunter. I personally really enjoy the fight, as it uniquely combines underwater combat and land combat. The fight takes place in the Tainted Sea, a unique locale that contains broken ships and dragonators littering the area. The in-game description for Diamoralis reads as follows. Some legends consider this dragon to be the fated devil to destroy the world, while others claim it is the giant who birthed creation. Is there any way for mere humans to quell its unending rage? Dimorellus shares the Fatalis skeleton, with a few adjustments around the face, and instead of having wings, Dimorellus has cannons that it can shoot meteors out of, which makes it interesting to look at. Dimorellus is covered in magma cores that glow bright orange and are located on its legs, shoulders, chest, and wing cannons. The magma cores in the wings and head of Dimorellus can be broken. Dimorellus also has quite a few similarities to the Fatalis trio, but bears the most resemblance to White Fatalis out of the three Fatalis. When the fight starts, a cutscene will play showcasing Dimorellus showering the arena in meteors and roaring. Personally, I think the Diamorellis fight is very interesting, all because of the shift from water combat to land combat. It epitomizes the experience of playing third gen Monster Hunter, having both water and land. Once the cutscene ends, fireballs will start to rain down on the shores of the Tainted Sea. The best way to engage in the fight is by breaking the magma cores on Diamorellis' body. The player should try to break these parts of Diamorellis during the fight as they will deal the most damage. Once you've broken them all, the head of the chest is the next best part of the body to aim for. The 
best time to attack the chest is when you topple die Morales. Around the map, there are several Dragonators that can be used to aid you when fighting Dia Morales. Dia Morales has two modes of attack, either on its hind legs or on all fours, which it will switch between throughout the fight. When Dia Morales reaches half health, it will enter armor mode, which causes all melee attacks to bounce off of any parts of its body that is not a weak spot. When Dia Morales enters this state, players should attack the glowing magma cores as you won't bounce off of them even if they were previously destroyed. It will then exit this state if the chest is broken or it is close to dying. Dia Morales' moves include tail swipes, the snap and drag, firing meteors, roaring and body slams. There are a grand total of 9 calves, 3 on the head, 3 on the upper body and 3 on the lower body. The fight honestly isn't that challenging, at least compared to the other Black Dragons. I'd say Dia Morales is the least challenging Black Dragon in the mainline series. It is a fun fight though, and the weapons and armor look really cool. In my view, it can be compared to Old Gen Fatalis, but an Old Gen Fatalis that is actually fun, has fair hitboxes and doesn't one-shot you. Every 3rd gen elder, except for Amatsu was in 3 ultimate, so Seatus, Gemmoran and Alatrine all reappeared, with Gemmoran and Alatrine receiving G rank counterparts. In 3 ultimate, they also added high rank village, which expanded on Tri's village, improving it. Once again, Seedus can only be fought in Village. There are almost no changes to the fight from Tri, however, they did add the Telegraph swimming attack towards the Dragonator. Seedus' model is updated, and Seedus lost the ability to use the Dragon element in the fight, so it can no longer inflict Dragon Blight via physical attacks towards the player, but it can still use the Water element on the Hunter. Apart from that, Seedus is still the final low rank Village boss. Some other things I forgot to mention about the fight is that the first time you fight Seedus, when it is killed, a cutscene will play, showing Seedus leaving Moga Village. This then resolves the story of Mons Hunter Tri. Gen Moran has a sand beam added to its repertoire of moves, but apart from that, it is just the same old Gen. You still fight it in the Great Desert and have to deal with it constantly attacking the ship. Gen can now be fought in Village in 3 Ultimate, as well as Port Tanzia. There is no low rank version of Gen Moran, as it is only fightable in high rank and G rank in 3 Ultimate. Alatrium was added in Village Monsanto 3 Ultimate, being able to be fought in solo high rank village. There are a few changes to the fight, namely, there are now ballistae placed around the sacred land, allowing hunters to bind Alatrium for good damage opportunities during the fight, which was an addition that I certainly welcomed. Alatrium will now enter flight mode at almost random intervals during the fight, and will mostly enter flight mode when enraged. Furthermore, breaking both horns does not prevent Alatrium from entering flight mode. Apart from that, weren't too many other changes.
Like I said before, Generation 3 was a transitional point in the series, where the game shifted from the older style to the newer styles of gameplay, particularly in 3 Ultimate, with the graphics looking more polished than they had ever been before. The 7 Elder Dragons in the game were all fun to fight, none of them ever felt boring, and in Tri in particular, they felt really sparse, making them feel more special when you did encounter them. The subspecies they added do still feel more like colour swaps rather than fully fledged counterparts, but they had more differences than first and second gen Elder Dragon subspecies, so I'm not complaining. I would love to see Gen Moran or Dia Morales return in Monster Hunter Wilds. It'd be really cool to see how they might rework the sandship mechanics, or see how Dia Morales would work in a modern Monster Hunter. Overall, Gen 3's Elders are really strong in the Monster Hunter roster, and are some of the most fun monsters in the series.